Speaking of which, Jamie Pollard, Director of Athletics at Iowa State, joins us on 365 Sports. Jamie, what is the reaction, if you don't mind, when your games that you have are, it's in Austin, but they're on the Longhorn Network. Is that kind of annoying or just kind of the way the schedule plays out? Can't leave soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh. Lord. I, I, I didn't know how you were going to react that to that one. Question? Yes. Yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, let, let's discuss that. And thank you for your time, by the way. Tomorrow, Chad Weiberg is going to join us. We had Gene Taylor last week. What does just getting the exit agreement finalized mean for everybody else that will be re remaining among the Big 12? Well, it just, you know, to get it finalized just allows us to move forward and be a lot more productive. Quite frankly, having that hanging out there, you had to do double of everything. 14 game schedule, a 12 game schedule, you know, a 14 team, excuse me, 14 team, a 12 team. And you do that through all the sports. And so it just, it caused a lot of extra work. And so now just having that finalized is just nice. We can put it behind us. We can start, you know, having the more streamlined meetings where you don't feel like you, you know, got to say, okay, for this part of the meeting, the two of you need to leave the room. Um, and I think it just, allows us to really start to coalesce around, you know, the 12 with the four new coming on board and developing those relationships and, and starting to develop some rivalry. How, how strange is it? And I've asked a couple different athletic directors, this based on your years of doing this to have a schedule this year that you will not have coming back around. This schedule has nothing to do with next year. You don't have to, okay, well, we went to their place and they've got to come to ours and just have a one year. Is it kind of like the COVID year plus more games? What's that like? You know, I, I I'm not even giving it a second thought. Mm. So to us, it's a non-issue. It's just, that's our schedule this year. And, and, you know, we'll get another schedule for the following year. So, haven't spent any time thinking or worrying about that. Your basketball team, I know they didn't win Saturday. Heck of a game in Manhattan. They're really good. Very explosive. Your thoughts about what you see from them, obviously, the game tonight in Austin against UT. Well, you know, our league, and, you know, I'm everybody's saying it. I'm on the basketball committee, so I know it. Um, I mean, our this is unprecedented. The fact that, you know, the committee had – five teams in the top 12 on Saturday. It's never happened before. There's been five teams in the top 16, but never five teams in the top 12. And quite frankly, you could, you know, you can make the case that we'll drop Texas and add Houston. And then we had two teams in the final four, um, you know, the top four teams. And so to have three of our teams, Baylor, Texas, and Kansas in the top seven, you know, it's just, it's phenomenal. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about where Iowa State is. The fact that we were 11th in that overall um, selection ranking, you know, it's not what anybody anticipated we'd have this year. So in a lot of ways, you know, we're playing on house money, um, you know, yet I want to see us finish it the right way because I think we've got the potential to, you know, really do well come the NCAA tournament time. What's – Jamie, you've seen comments from Brett Yormark about, um, you know, basketball being undervalued and seen comments about that elsewhere. A lot of times with just whether it be TV deals or the money flowing, there's a lot of focus on football and then to a lesser extent, men's basketball. How much of a diamond in the rough do you feel like that that is potentially and how much uh, does that basketball potential excite you guys about the future of the conference and what the, the image and identity will be part of? Well, you know, if, if it's, Correct. If he's right, there's a huge opportunity for us. You know, time will tell, but we're going to do things to position ourselves in a way to test that market when the time comes with the next television deal five years or six years from now. You know, we, what we've got to do as the schools is we've got to continue to be smart about scheduling, continue to be intentional, and deliberate about our investments in basketball and our decision making and continue to make sure we keep this spot. I mean, we're hands down the best league in the country at least three years running, and we need to make sure we protect that position. And so we've got to do things. You know, even with 12 teams, we're not going to get to play everybody twice going forward. 
and that that in itself is going to weaken our net rankings. And so we've just we've got to be very deliberate and intentional about the moves we make to make sure we protect that because it is even if it doesn't materialize into more money in the television in the future, it's a battle cry that is really important for our league's brand. So does that mean that you'll have to schedule even more tough non-conference games? I mean, not that you guys aren't already doing it and playing in the best tournaments, but maybe one or two more of those just to help your, your net ranking, like you said? I don't know if I want to go there yet. Mm-hmm. I just I don't think we can – let our guard down and just say, Hey, we're the best league. And if we just keep doing what we're doing, the, the, the recipe is going to get tweaked a little Be, and not because Texas and Oklahoma are leaving because you can make the case that Houston's going to actually strengthen it. But you know, you've always had Kansas, you've always had Baylor, you know, you've always had the good teams on your schedule twice. And mathematically that can't happen going forward. Um, one of the things that, the committee is really valued about the big 12 is we played everybody twice with only 10 of us. There really hasn't been a bottom. We've proven it this year, the way Oklahoma and Texas tech uh, have played when they've taken turns being quote at the bottom of the standings where some other leagues, you know, they're, they're clearly nights off when you play the bottom of the league, there's no night off in the big 12. So I think we just have to be careful because as we move forward, that recipe is getting tweaked and, it's going to change, but I'm not certain how we adapt to that change. And that's what I mean. I think we got to be smart and pay attention and be deliberate and intentional about our next move. Jamie, one of your responses to when Craig was bringing up the, the possibility of Gonzaga or whatever else is in the future when it comes to basketball, you said about Brett Yormark bringing that up, is if he's right. Uh, isn't that part of what he brings to the table that it's some new vision that is allowing the conference to look elsewhere for revenue? Absolutely. You know, and so I'm not saying it to disagree with the commissioner. What I'm just saying is, you know, we won't know the ultimate answer to that question, right, until you go back to the marketplace. And so um, if he's right, if he's correct, and there is a market to split apart basketball from football and, you know, in theory have somebody else be the either compete make the the current entity have to compete to have the basketball or maybe another entity values basketball more than who the current parties are. But we, we're not going to know that really, you know, until we get back into the marketplace. But, you know, one of the strategic things I think commissioner has brought to the table is the current contract didn't allow us to pull those apart. Mm -hmm. And so we're putting in provisions in the next contract to make sure that, we have the bil- ability, if we so desire to pull it apart, that we can. You, uh, by the way, and, and for those you mentioned this earlier, a part of the NCAA Men's Basketball Committee in the fourth year of a five-year term. Jamie, what's that like? We see where football is so the way they select whoever's going to play for the national title or the semifinals, and that's about to go even expand further. It just seems like there's this angst every week when they have that show, whatever they do to try to market what's happening in college football to be a part of the men's basketball committee. Is it maybe not as much, is it stressful or is it fun? How would you describe that? Well, it's certainly fun. And, you know, it's a lot of work, a ton of work. And though, you know, my colleagues that have been on the CFP committee, we love that. There's a Joe Castiglione has been on both and he, you know, he can speak factually from both sides and he would say the cfb committee is a walk in the cake walk in the park because one you don't have to do it all year long and number two you're really only having to deal with a few teams where in the ncaa basketball committee you're dealing with a lot of teams and a lot of different scenarios so um so it is a ton of work but it's a lot of fun and it's been really educational both professionally you know, I, I know the model that TJ and I are using scheduling-wise for Iowa State is founded a lot on what I've learned by being in that room. But it's also been educational on a personal level. Is You know, I'm like 99.9% of the other people prior to being on the committee. I assume the committee, you know, had all this clandestine approach to how they get matchups and who plays where. And, and that, I can tell you unequivocally, doesn't even – happen not even 
one ounce of our time is spent on that. Quite frankly, on Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock, once we have the team finally in the final order, 1 to 68, the computer creates the brackets. We don't. So when people try to say the committee is orchestrated, somebody to play somebody somewhere, I can assure you without a doubt that it did not happen. Jamie Pollard, Director of Athletics at Iowa State with us on 365 Sports. That actually makes it seem that much cooler to me that you would just be sitting in the room like us, like, oh, my God, they're going to play here and they could play a man. Uh, That does seem like it's pretty fun. Do you, um, when you look at how you guys used to schedule or how they used to schedule and how they do now with the quads and the different ways they're ranking, is it simpler now than it used to be or is it more complex because there's more information? Well, for, so you're talking from an individual school about how we schedule our games? No, about uh, or, picking the, tr- the, tr- the tournament. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I quite honestly, guys, I have no idea how they did it in the yesteryears where they didn't have a computer to do it. Because with all the rules about, you know, if you play somebody three times, you can't play them before, you know, the round of thir- or the round of eight. If you play somebody twice, you can play them in the round of 16, but not before. If you play somebody once, you can't play them in the first round. You know, you, you get to go with the top 16 schools, go to the closest site. And, you know, all of those factors, BYU can't play on Sundays. And I don't know how they ever kept track of all that. <laughs> we have it built into the computer program. So you just put in the teams from 1 to 68, and the computer spits out the bracket that work for that um now on sunday typically because you have three or four games that still have to be played out the big 10 the american i think the ivy league trying to think there's another league in there so you'll have contingency brackets so last year on sunday at like one o'clock there were 10 different possible brackets depending on what happened later in the day in those conference tournament games so how they did that before I don't know. There was probably errors made because I don't know how you would keep track of all that. But, um, you know, the computer does it for us. Jamie, the, uh, the, the background you had, you were a CPA at Arthur Anderson Company in Milwaukee. How much did that time for a couple of years in that business help you run an athletic department? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you're going back in yesteryears for me. You know, one of the things I always like to share with our folks about that is, you know, I I was in what they called entrepreneurial services, which meant privately held companies. And so you met a lot with the owners, you know, you walked their plants, you saw their inventory, you did their tax returns. And back then, you know, I, I didn't understand what I didn't know, right? Like all of us when you're younger. But when I fast forward to today, I think back to those days and when I'm dealing with donors today, you know, those donors are those same people, owners of companies, family businesses, great pride in their, and I, you know, and so I have a a perspective of being able to ask questions and engage with people that I wouldn't have had if I wouldn't have had that foundation 30 years ago of being in some of those situations where I got exposed to those challenges that people have and the way people think about you know, their giving and their business and their legacy. And so I think it's been that part of it's been really helpful to me. Jamie, again, with us on 365 Sports. So you mentioned when I asked you at the start about the Longhorn Network, that game tonight, looking forward, where this place was, this Big 12, two summers ago and where you are now and the incoming four, how healthy the conference is, the new deal, maybe even expansion, who knows? or realignment, whatever that would be. How are you, Are you uh, at times, do you stop and go, man, we really pulled this off when there were thoughts it could be a disaster? Absolutely. Um, I tell our fans all the time, I mean, I'll go back past this. I'll go back to the first time, back when A&M and Nebraska and Colorado, Missouri left. You know, we, I said Iowa State was dangling over the cliff. So was Baylor. Um, I remember a clandestine meeting that Lou Perkins organized for the and Baylor was part of that with us and when we got to the meeting in Kansas City Baylor wasn't there and I asked Lou what happened where's Baylor and he goes I didn't invite him and it was like a wake-up call of their <laughs> have nots within the have not right and but I share that with our fan base because that was I don't know remember 2010 mm-hmm. um 
And if you would have told me in 2010 at that particular moment where I was probably hanging over the edge of the cliff with somebody holding on to just one of my ankles that, hey, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, Iowa State will have had their best last decade of finance, athletics, facilities. They'd be in the best position they've ever been in. I would have thought like, you know, okay, what are you drinking or smoking? Because <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. But that's where we are. And so when Texas and Oklahoma announced they were leaving, you know, what was that, two years ago, a year and a half ago, whenever it was, that was my message to our fan base is, I know right now you're going, wow, what happened? But I can't tell you that we, nobody can tell us that 10 years from now, we might go, that's the best thing that ever happened yeah. to the big was them leaving. And, you know, here we are a year and a half later, and it's kind of starting to look like that. And so, um, you know, you just, I'm an optimist, and so I'm going to keep forging forward, and I'm excited where we are. I'm thankful for where we are as a league, and I'm very optimistic about what the future holds for all of us. If, in fact, that the conference does add, let's say, basketball teams only, not that others may not have other sports, but let's say in the, in the term of Gonzaga, to use them as an example, they don't have football. Would there still they, – they wouldn't get a full share, would they? Has that even been discussed that they would get a partial share based on the tournament? How would that work for somebody that doesn't have football when it comes to the media money? Well, it hasn't been discussed. Okay. So – I would make the assumption that they would get a pro ratted share of, you know, based on what they bring to the table, they wouldn't get an equal share because um, they wouldn't be making the same equal investment that the rest of us are making either. But it hasn't been discussed. As an AD in the conference that has been rated before in the Big 12 with the latest one, Texas and Oklahoma, you mentioned Nebraska OU and, of course, in, the, in, in between A&M and also Missouri, do you look at another conference right now that's kind of trying to figure themselves out like the Pac-12 and feel for them? How, how do you look at what they're dealing with? Well, I'd be lying if I didn't say I don't feel for them. Many of them are my favorite, you know, some of my best colleagues. Rob Mullins at Oregon, I was his best man in his wedding. So, um, you know, I, I don't wish ill will upon anybody, and nor would I want to wish ill will upon us. But – at the same time, I'm glad it's them and not us because, you know, it's been us way too many times. And I still have calluses from 2010 and calluses from a year and a half ago. So it's kind of nice for it not to be us. But, you know, at the same time, I've always tried to, you know, live my life holistically and, you know, be careful what you wish upon others because it can turn on you in a dime. And so, um, keep my head down, keep doing what's best for Iowa State and the Big 12, and um, you know, just be grateful that we're blessed to be in the position we're in. Do ADs from other conferences talk much? Do you guys, like, for example, if someone from that conference was to call you and, and pick your brain, and you mentioned Rob Mullins or whoever, is that something that happens quite a bit, text messages or phone calls, or is that really not, If maybe if there's a convention? Well, it's human nature. You talk to those that you're the closest to. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I can only speak for my relationships with the individuals that I have in those situations. And I always try to just be respectful and not want our friendship to become about that issue. So a lot of times I won't even bring it up. You know, I just avoid it just because I, again, go back to a holistic approach to life. If the roles were reversed, I'm not certain I'd always want them asking me mm -hmm. those questions. So, um, I, you know, I've Dave Geeky who from Arizona is on the basketball committee with me, and and I, I spent all week with him last week in Indianapolis. Sat next to him at dinner two times. I never asked him one time about it because I just felt like, you know what, what I'm not going to ask him. What can he tell me? Yeah. Right? What can he tell me in that setting. So why even ask the question? Don't even infringe upon our friendship. If there was something to be asked that he needed my opinion or my advice, he'd ask me. Are you happy with where the Big 12 is now, or do you feel like because of the unknown that there might need still to be some changes and in, in even additions in the future? I'm really excited about where we're at, and I look forward to uh, starting life you know, in that capacity at 12. Could there be other additions? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to look back very long. To, to not realize that could be the case, but 
I don't live my life thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm embracing the 12 we have. And until something the commissioner says, hey, it's going to be different because this is happening or that's happening, I'm not going to spend a lot of time worrying about something I don't have a lot of control over. I will. You know, I, I don't have the ultimate vote. It'll be my president and we'll be one twelfth of a vote and whatever's supposed to be will be. But until that point, I'm going to make the 12 of us the best we can possibly be. Jamie, you're an inspiration for a lot of people for what you've done in your life. Also with what you've battled, but also tell Nick Jost, we said, hi, great friend of us uh, and his time at Baylor. And now with what he does, we appreciate him. And also thank you as always for time on the show today and good luck coming up tonight in Austin. Well, thank you very much. And uh, when our men's team is there a week from now, I won't be there because I'll be at the Big 12 wrestling tournament. But uh, tell Coach Drew to go easy on my cyclone. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. <laughs> oh, Appreciate that. I think the cyclones <laughs> hammered Scott Drew and company uh, up at Ames to start the conference schedule. In a week and a half, it's going to be senior day, and Flagler's finally going to be a, a senior, isn't he? Is yeah. he finally going to be done? And, you know, all the emotion, and you know, just remember, we still want a good seed, so don't like put like twenty on us or something. I mean, let, let it be a one possession game. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Oh. And from the very first thing he said, his transparency and honesty, uh, when we asked him about tonight's game against Texas on the Longhorn Network down in Austin. Good stuff. Yeah, 